Hi, this is Misery Yuan, and you are watching WWDB TV. Welcome to Misery Loves Company. Today, my special guest is the super duper suck lord. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right. First things first. <clears throat> what on earth is a suck lord, and how did you come up with it? Uh, the suck lord is a professional title I came up for myself to describe uh, what I do in my company, Suckadelic. But how did you come up with it? Like, do you suck that badly? I mean, does your work suck? What's going on? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, basically, as you know, the suck lord is a study in contrasts and it was a way to sort of reconcile my misanthropy with my megalomania and give people a little sense of what they were getting from me. Because I was doing DIY projects from music to action figures. And, you know, when you do something with no budget in your mom's bedroom or whatever, uh, there's quality issues. And, and also add to that the bad taste that goes along with, with a lot of my concepts. So I just thought it'd be, I thought I'd do the, the customer a favor by letting them know up front that the company was, that the shit would suck. So I called the company Suckadelic with the idea that it was like transformational sucking. You know, you've heard the, um, the phrase so, so bad that it's good. Yeah. Well, this was so good that it's bad. So I decided instead of trying to hide the fact that I was struggling and putting out inferior products, I'd build that into the brand and the aesthetic. And then when I needed the title of an ambassador to go out and represent these, these so-called products, the Suck Lord was the title that occurred to me. And you've done so well for yourself, for branding yourself Def for, oh, yes. for okay. something that, to suck so badly. I remember one year at Comic-Con while you were putting your little figures, you were like, who the fuck is buying these things? You guys are fucking idiots. These things suck. <laughs> You're an asshole for buying this is yeah. one of the slogans. That is exactly right. For the company. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. People like to be in on the joke. Why do you think you've become so successful in your own way? How, like, uh, how did that even happen? I don't know if I would call this success. <laughs> I think you're doing pretty well. I mean, I've seen people come up to you for your autograph and photos with you and And, and that stuff. defines you have success fans? to you. Well, you have fans, so. Yeah, I know I have fans. I mean, look at this, look you. at this personality. Look at this. How can you not have fans? I'm kidding. I'm terrible. I'm, I have no value. Um, I don't know. It's like I, I don't know who the fuck is watching this. I'm going to give a little background before we start discussing the nuances. I make custom-made bootleg action figures. Basically, I've always been a toy collector and a toy fan since I was a kid. I grew up during the golden age of Star Wars. And buying the toys was always a big part of my sort of interaction with my fandom. And as I got older and found myself being attracted to the, the artist lifestyle, the works that I created took the form of the toys I used to play with as a, as a child. The blister pack, this little three and three quarter figure inside a on a little board with a little bubble over it, blister package. And I wanted to make those things and I actually tried to work for Hasbro. I wanted to make real Star Wars toys and I worked in the, the, the periphery of that world for a decade and a half and I was never able to ascend, thank God, if I wound up becoming a <laughs> faceless Star Wars toy maker, I would be miserable. And then the so-called designer toy world sprouted up, which is like, I guess if people have heard of fucking Kid Robot, well before Kid Robot there were a lot of artists and graffiti people and streetwear designers that were collaborating with um, companies in China and Japan making like sort of artist design toys, action figures. Yeah. And I tried to get in that scene too. And I was thwarted for various reasons, mostly that I just wasn't cool enough. And after like almost 20 years of trying to break into the toy industry from all the different entrances that I was able to perceive and all of them were locked, I got pissed off and I decided that I have to start making things by myself by hand and I had no money or no, no real resources so I just started cobbling together things out of repurposed Star Wars figures. You know, I'd chop off a head and switch it around and then I'd make a little mold of that and then pour a little casting resin shit you can buy in the art supply store and making little multiples and additions and they weren't coming out very good because it's not an exact science for one and A. I was a beginner, 
And so I just said, fuck you. My, it was like, <laughs> fuck you for not inviting me into the toy world. So I'm going to make like the worst shit I can come up with <laughs> as a sort of statement. And I guess people responded to that sentiment or that stance because there's a lot, you know, I, I labeled myself the super villain, you know, and that, that my toy efforts had a nefarious purpose and they were serving to say fuck you to, to the people that had wronged me and to sort of elevate and aggrandize myself, but I was sort of elevating and celebrating something that was arguably not very good and that's sort of how the sort of psychedelic you know, soup was concocted, and I guess some, a lot of people responded to that, you know, because other people are in similar positions in their creative life, and I guess that somehow I was able to bust through and create these products that people wanted to buy and made money off of it, and here we are. <laughs> you know, so that's basically it. Like, my, the most successful product I ever created was the Gay Empire figure, which is basically a uh, pink stormtrooper. You have a couple of copycats from that now, don't you? Isn't there other people <coughs> doing that? And I've seen people cosplaying as like gay pink stormtroopers at conventions now as well. Well, what do you know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think you told me one time that someone came up to you with their own little pink stormtrooper and was like, "Check it out! I made one too." Yeah, a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people do that. Uh, that's How have you not gotten sued yet? <laughs> well. Um, all, all kinds of reasons. I mean, like the gay empire figure is basically a Star Wars figure, but it doesn't say Star Wars on it. Like the diff, like I called them bootlegs because I wanted to sort of associate it with the sort of illicit nature of an actual bootleg toy or a counterfeit product. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not really a bootleg. It's just good old fashioned artistic appropriation and like. They say that as far as copyright law goes, if you change something by 20%, then mm -hmm. it's sort of like a new version of it. And it's like for a thing to be a bootleg, a real bootleg, and it's funny that, that because of this so-called art movement, you have to come up with the, the diff, you have to differentiate between a real bootleg and an artist bootleg. Um, a real bootleg seeks to fool the consumer. Whereas, like, I would go to a, 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 a schlocky, you know, 99 cent store and there'd be a figure that said Star Wars or Stars mm -hmm. Wars. And it's sort of like a, 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 a shitty facsimile of a real Star Wars toy, but it's, mas it's masquerading as a real toy. Whereas my products are not. Like, it's a gay empire figure. It doesn't say Star Wars. It's not, the person doesn't, there's no gay Star Wars figure that it's competing with. Yeah. You know, so it's sort of its own thing. And so it's not worth it. There's no money to be recouped, really, from suing me. And there's just no reason to do it. And at this point, it's been going on for 15 years. It's, it just, there's just no reason to do it. And I think maybe tacitly, and this is just a guess, that having this little subculture of, of people that make their own interpretations of Star Wars things uh, helps, helps them, the culture, because um, and helps for their branding and advertising because it just demonstrates the just continual applicability of their brand, you know, and it's like they can't maybe go out there and make a gay stormtrooper, but it helps them that it exists, you know, it just, it just permeates their brand into fields that, <laughs> that they can't go to themselves. Is your obsession with Star Wars the reason behind the Suck Lord helmet? Um, yes, yes it is. Yeah? yeah? Tell me about the helmet and why you chose it to be your brand. And why do you not wear it anymore? <laughs> I wear it occasionally. Do you? Yeah, um, well, the, the, the Suck Lord is, a, is a derived from the character Boba Fett. Yes. When I was growing up, when the S Empire Strikes Back, which was the second Star Wars movie, in case you don't know, <laughs> um, when the build up to the release of that movie, was coming out, um, they revealed there's this new character, a new villain in the, in the movie called Boba Fett. And there was a little offer where you can mail away for the, f the figure. And he was just this cool looking guy at a helmet like this, you know, in this sort of hot, this like patchwork armor. And it's just, it's just an interesting looking character. And he's a villain and he's a bounty hunter. And you didn't know anything about him. And it was just compelling. You know, it was just like, wow, because, you know, we already had these 19 other Star Wars figures and then now here's a new one and it just looks fascinating you know he just looked so correct right there with Storm Darth Vader and the Stormtrooper and everything and he's a mercenary and he's a sort of a amoral character that's sort of self-interested and 
I was just attracted to the way it looked. And I was a small, kind of shy kid, you know, I got picked on and I wasn't super confident. And on Halloween, I was going to go as Boba Fett and I cobbled together from like a store-bought mask and some other pieces a Boba Fett costume and just putting the costume on was empowering, you know, because it's like you can't see what a little loser nerd I am. <laughs> you know, nobody could see me and you're sort of protected in there and like you can sort of project this air of menace and mystery. And I'm walking around in the Halloween parade with my little gun made out of like uh, paper, paper towel rolls painted black. It was just made out of paper. And I had these little smoke bombs and I thought, and it was like, I was like the sort of first, you know, you know all about this, you know, just like my first sort of experience about the power that cosplaying has as far as like personal reinvention and mm -hmm. defining yourself and sort of like building yourself up and creating like a sort of aspirational version of who you want to be. And then, you know, so while I was in some formative years, Boba Fett helped me get to that place. And then when I got older, when I was in like my mid-20s and then late 90s, uh, the new Star Wars movies that were going to be like, they were going to redo the originals and then they were going to put out three new ones. And um, I was a DJ at the time. And I was oh, making... Really? What kind of music was this? I was making hip hop and be dusty beats and sampled bass stuff and, you know, beat digging stuff and bedroom bedroom stuff, you know, making shit with drum machines and samples. And there was a little rap in there, here and there. And I was like, I want to put out a record. And it was like, nobody knows who the fuck I am. So, like, what kind of record should I put out that's going to make get some publicity? And because the new Star Wars movies were coming out and because Star Wars was like 20 years old, it was like it had a big nostalgia factor whereas like it was geeky to like star wars when when it was when you were in elementary yeah. school like the star wars kids were kind of the, the 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 less cool ones over t 20 two decades it became kind of hipsterish and cool to like and retro to like be mm -hmm. into star wars you know and i knew more about it was the only thing i had any expertise in so i said i'm going to make a hip hop record based around star wars so i'm going to take all my beats and my breaks and I'm going to throw Star Wars s samples on it and just like make little instrumental songs about um, using Star Wars sonic material, the music, the dialogue, the sound effects, whatever, called Star Wars Breakbeats. And I put this out and I was like, okay, well, I need to sell this record. I want to go out and make people listen to it because there was a lot of gatherings around the time they started doing this convention called this is 1999 the star wars celebration which was like a comic-con which is only star wars and you know they would do that thing this was sort of before the internet so like mm -hmm. when you wanted to go see a movie you had to go to the box office and buy the ticket in person and they made this big thing about waiting in line for a month you know like people were camping out for the star wars episode one so there was this just captive audience of people camping out outside the movie theater so it's like i'm gonna go and i'm gonna blast my music but i'm not gonna go as me i'm not gonna <laughs> go with the, like, just some guy you know i need this needs to be a character so it's like what can i do and it was obviously the just the sort of reflexive thing was just like i'll just get a boba fett costume mm -hmm. you know and so i got the uh, upgraded the costume and then i added hip-hop details like the gold chain i had graffiti on the helmet and fat laces and i had this big boom box and I had I remember the boom and box. I actually <laughs> had a fucking cassette tape in there playing my music on loop and then I would sell I had CDs in my pockets and I would just sell it to people I'd walk around comic-con and people would see me and like, oh, look at the graffiti Boba Fett uh, you know and <laughs> and 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 that was sort of the character and again you know just like the Boba Fett veneer gave me a certain amount of confidence to go out and stand there and have the audacity to like blast this music, you know, because they can't see my face, so who yeah. fucking cares? So the an anonymity of it gave me power. And then as that went on and I started doing the toy things and I started making movies and stuff like that about my sort of fantasy world, the character went from being like hip-hop Boba Fett to the suck word. To the ladies' man. Yeah, I mean, I just <laughs> sort of like took, I sort of moved, took the Boba Fettness out of it a little bit and added other things, like I gave him a lightsaber and a cape and some platinum jewelry and it was just made him all silver and it was still Boba Fett-ish but it was like kind of my own spin on it and I stopped calling it Boba Fett and I called that the Suck Lord and then I made my first figure based on that character and then it just went from there and then I just sort of used the Boba Fett mask as a sort of 
repository for all my aspirational version, you know, ideas of myself. You know, he gets girls, he gets money, he's, <laughs> he's famous, and it kind of came true. You know, I, I, I actually <laughs> used it. No, this is no joke. You I know? know, I know. I was a part of that realm. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I but I mean, any, any, anybody who does cosplay <laughs> understands that it's not just wearing a costume. You know, you're inv invoking something, and by making it manifest and living and inhabiting th that character, you know, you're bringing it about. You know, and that's sort of how I was able to make the magnificent specimen you see before you now. I don't need to wear the mask anymore because I'm fully inhabiting now the self I wanted to be when I started doing this. I'm rich, <laughs> I fuck, and I fly all over the world doing incredible things that you would only dream about. He has But you these, could do it too. Uh, I think when I first met him, it was like... I'm creating this like YouTube channel. We're gonna do all these crazy super villain videos, but in reality, it was hit, like you, a couple other super male villains, but then there was a bunch of women villains <laughs> that were a thing. But like the way he wrote the script, we were all fighting to sleep with you. <laughs> hey, <laughs> art imitates life. And now, and now I wanted to make it realistic. Oh yes. <laughs> But now it's become a, a total thing, right? Like, uh, women are fighting to, like, get into your pants now, aren't they? I wouldn't they? say they were fighting because, first of all, there's enough to go around. <laughs> and everybody's very civilized about it. <laughs> you know, everybody waits their turn. Everybody's cool about it. You know. Isn't it crazy that all the things that we grew up getting made fun of, liking, are now so popular and so, like... I don't know, it's so mainstream now. Because I remember when we first used to go to Comic-Con San Diego, it was all just a bunch of dorks hanging out and stuff like that. But now it's just so crowded yeah, and that's so why I don't go anymore. to be at. I mean, I, just, I don't find it surprising just because I think everybody realized how much fun we were having. Yeah. You know, and just how... Just being ourselves. You yeah, know? and just, you know, it's... Uh, I just think the culture has changed a lot, and I think people are less concerned about being la laughed at or don't care like people want to just have fun and be themselves and it takes it takes <clears throat> it takes courage and risk you know to actually to do that type of stuff and you know we were having a lot of fun and they were like hey we can we can sell these suckers something and let's let's make this corporate yeah, I've seen a lot of people who, um, you know, are very shy, quiet, and withdrawn, but then they put on a costume and, and they, they become come like alive. A, yeah, a completely different person. And I think it's absolutely mm -hmm. awesome because it, like you said, it gives them kind of like a purpose. They're kind of role playing and they're becoming the character that they idolize the most, you know, and it, it makes them come pretty much out of their shell. So yeah, but I it's love like, seeing that. Yeah, but it's like it starts out as you're maybe wearing a costume, but as you inhabit the costume and, and sort of, take up take on or try to Im imitate the attributes of these larger than life characters you realize oh these things are actually inside of me you know and the more you inhabit that character the more you realize it's always been there you know and i just needed this sort of like avatar to 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 get it out and you know i think it's a great thing and it's like even it's it's even with the toy the toy making stuff is another component to that Whereas just like, I know so many people who have had problems with drugs and alcohol or being in jail or depression <laughs> or all kinds of stuff and sort of found in the toy making uh, practice uh, some sort of purpose, you know, yeah. something that it, it takes up so much space in your thoughts and your minds and your hands and your busy work that it gives people something to do and it gives people purpose and it gives people a means for expression and it's like it's cool because it's not really art in the same sense as like if you're being an artist with a capital A and you're trying to be a painter or a photographer and show in galleries and museums and do all that pretentious shit you're just making fucking toys it's not the the expectation of it being important and meaningful and profound isn't there you know so you don't need so you can just do dumb shit if you want to and then <laughs> <laughs> and then Let it build. Yeah, and then it, and then you don't know what comes out of you because people start doing this. Most people, when they start doing this, they they start out imitating me. <laughs> you know, mo I know. every every guy that starts 
decides he wants to be a bootleg toy maker, will make a Suck Lord tribute piece and send it to me. I've got boxes of this shit. God bless. You know? <laughs> and then after a while, they start finding their own voice mm -hmm. in it. And some people have done just some phenomenal, incredible work, stuff that I would never have thought of personally. And so, you know, it's good, good, for, the, good for them. And <clears throat> I mean, now <clears throat> I've been here in Vegas this weekend at the, at the AVN porn mm -hmm. convention. I was going to ask about your hat. <laughs> giving them, giving the, giving them a new bar for them to, to to aspire towards. You know, it's like I'm starting to really come into myself in the porn world, and that's always been something that I've always struggled with. Is you know my you know sexuality and how to like express myself in a way. You're overly sexual. I'm hyper. I'm super sexualized. And I wasn't really able to find the outlet for that in like the civilian world. Yeah, and I I saw you on um, there was a dating game or yeah, what was that? Yeah, I was on a few dating shows. Uh, it's the one where you like scared the woman. <laughs> Thank God. I mean, that's good that she got scared and didn't pick me because that wouldn't that wouldn't have worked. <sighs> but yeah, <clears throat> they put me on television, and they have like the three guys behind the curtain, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then the other, and then the person picking, like asking them questions and picking who they want to date just based on their answers. And they coach you a little bit. Like they sort the, the producer sort of susses you out mm -hmm. and figures out, okay, you're the jock, you're the you're the mysterious loner, and and you're you're the sleazy porn guy. <laughs> you know, it's like okay, that's not going to be too much of a stretch. So, <laughs> so I play I played that role, and it, you know, it wasn't fake. Yeah, you did really well. I, I mean, saw the real you in that episode. That, yeah, that was true. I mean, I've been on television a bunch of times, like reality TV shows. And yeah, you were on a Can't Get a Date. How does it feel going from having a hard time getting a date to fighting off women with sticks? How do you think it feels? <laughs> <laughs> no, I want you to tell me. I, they don't know how you feel. I want to hear it. <laughs> it feels right. It feels like okay about fucking time that I've got this shit together. You know, it's like it's always been something that I've saw for myself and had a lot of uh, internal obstacles that had to be surmounted. And going on TV and actually bearing, showing that side of myself was helpful. You, you know, had a lot of pussy after that for that, didn't you? <laughs> a lot of those girls who treated thought you were like a cute little puppy that needed to get laid were I like. I got me. more. I was. I got more <laughs> girls when I was on the art show. Which art show was that? I was on a show called Work of Art: The Next Great Artist, mm -hmm. which is like a reality show, like a competition style reality show in the in this vein of like Project Runway or Top Chef. Mm -hmm. You know, where they collect together a group of people that are all in the same profession, and then they got a panel of judges, and every episode they throw a, 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 spe a specified challenge at them. And then they all do their best to, to do the challenge, and then they, they, the judges look at their efforts, and one person wins and is elevated, and one person is eliminated and sent home. So yeah. it follows that format. And in this case, it was fine art. So they, I got cast on that. And I didn't succeed in the game. Of, like I lost. I got eliminated. I made some pretty bad artwork. How many rounds did you get into? I got before? to the sixth episode out of ten. Okay, but, that's not bad. But I, yeah, but I mean, it was I was that was a whole nother story about I, you know the failures that went along with that. But I won the so-called popular vote, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and I got a lot of girls just hitting me up. I had a, one of my best girlfriends ever, Meg Spector. Uh, Hi, Meg. Got at me. <laughs> got at me from that from that from that show. And, I thought you know, it was a that. can't get a date that she got on. No, I. Who did I get off? The I didn't. Uh, plenty of girls. The fu the thing about can't get a date was sort of pre-internet, so it didn't mm -hmm. it didn't get the wide exposure that that work of art did. So I still get hit up from work of art people every once in a while. That's awesome. Girls that want to fuck specifically. <laughs> I don't. F I don't do it. I don't fuck all of them though. No, just no. most of them, or the ones that are near you, the ones that are willing to travel. There's, with a, you. there's a number of factors to decide. You know, <laughs> Anyway, I thought you didn't want to talk about <laughs> sex stuff. You can talk about whatever you want to talk about. So what, what are you working on right now? Like Me? what is the suck lord investing his time into right now? Well, a couple of things. I still, I, uh, I'm trying to make larger work. Like I'm trying to make really big figures, like wallable stuff, mm -hmm. like uh, 
all the same things, but just like really big, like 10 times, 20 times the size that you can hang on the wall. And I'm going to try to pass that off as like real art, like contemporary art. And it's going to involve some 3D printing, which I was reluctant to do for a long time. But I'm going to develop that and I'm going to make some adult content. Shot some stuff last night and it involved action figures. That was that's so fascinating, at least to me, about how I was able to use my success as a as an action figure maker to to pave the way into the porn world. It's it's a one in a million story, and I can't believe it's happening. But I made some porno action figures, mm -hmm. and I sold them at the convention, and it got me involved with porn people that wanted to take that sort of same type of creativity and apply it to to to, to fuck tapes as they call them in the biz <laughs> and um, that and I'm gonna try to do another television show I feel like the porn industry though they they're looking for more products that are different and that's where you come in because you know there's so many videos so many photos and they toys don't, and stuff like that but like yours is actually like an action figure toy so it's completely different I think so I mean you know uh, it's not that easy in this day and age whether it's music or pornography or whatever to make money off intangible products you know like a song or a video mm -hmm. is so easily copied and disseminated outside of the pay the payment channels that it's really difficult to get paid so people are still making money off merchandise and physical ob physical sales and as the, the type of offerings that people that are in the jizz biz are selling to make big. money are not are you know they're they're not as innovative as they can be like I know girls sell their panties and stuff like that that's mm -hmm. like a way to make money but my angle with that is like the panties need to be in a really cool package mm -hmm. you know because like a big part of what made my toys successful wasn't the toy itself the object was a crude you know just piece of plastic but it was the packaging that mm -hmm. really sold it, you know, that really conveyed what it was supposed to mean and what it was about, you know, it gives it the context. So if you can make a porn flick, you know, and then there's objects that have been used in the porno movie, you know, you can sell those things, you know, mm -hmm. or just like, I don't want to get too explicit here, but, <laughs> you know. Yes. <laughs> it's like if, just just say that, like, if there's props in the movie that is, that is, that's come into contact with the intimate areas and the fluids of the female performers, and then you put that in a cool package that has the branding of the movie that you just jerked off to, you can buy that. It's, you know, and that's something a little bit more connected to the, to the, to the experience than just a t-shirt or a photo or a fucking mug or mm -hmm. whatever, or just like a pair of panties that have no real connection to the person you bought it from, but if it's in a nice, cool clamshell packaging mm -hmm. that has the girl's picture and little... And that's what new for you now is that what you're going to be working on yeah why not collaborating yeah why not about different ways to sell women's panties why not <laughs> that's awesome yeah. <laughs> i mean i support women entrepreneurs you support women in general you were raised by a single mother right yeah gay woman and a grandmother and other people but yeah one thing i do feel like inclined to do as i start to explore my my adult um products is like I only want to work with women creators like I don't want to work for any company that's run by a man I want only want to work with like women who run women's companies and women creators and I want them to do their ideas and I want to only build with their businesses I don't want to work in any sort of patriarchal system when it comes to the sex business Interestingly enough, your mom invented nipple clamps. She right? didn't invent nipple clamps, she no? perfected them. Perfected them. How did she perfect them? Well, <laughs> okay. It's a bit of a tale, but it's interesting. Um, my mother got divorced from my father in the mid 70s, and he was broke, so he couldn't really pay very much alimony. So she needed to find a way to make money, and she was artsy and creative, and she had a girlfriend who was also artsy and creative, and they were trying to figure out make shit to sell you know they wanted to make little tchotchkes and little mm -hmm. kitschy little jewelries they didn't know what the fuck they were doing they would go and buy little bits of junk it was almost the prototype of what i do now yeah i was like sounds literally familiar yeah they would go to like canal street and the rubber stores and they'd buy like this was like when punk was coming out and they wanted to make punk jewelry so they would buy like 
little shitty water guns and then screw them onto like a leather strap and you were supposed to wear it like a belt or like, you know, was, uh -huh. they were just screwing around trying to figure out how to sell this shit. And back in the day, there was, you know, the street called Canal Street where it was like all the surplus stores and industrial stores and stuff like that. That's all gone now, regrettably. New York's gone to shit. But, and they just sort of put these two alligator clamps little, you know, that are used for electrical, you know, wiring and stuff like this, these mm -hmm. two metal clamps on a chain. And it was like, oh, this is something that you can clip on to your leather jacket and you'll look like the sex pistols or whatever. And they went to all the little gay sex boutiques in the village showing them and, and they just went into this, uh, the place called the Pleasure Chest, which is still there. And there was like a sex toy store. And the have guy- Have you taken me there? Possibly. I feel like you possibly. have. Possibly. I feel like you have. Yeah, they would go, they went into this place called the Pleasure Chest and there was the guy looked, in, looked at it and said, oh, nipple clamp's cool, we'll take, we'll take two dozen. Mm. And, and I was like, what the fuck is a nipple clamp? <laughs> you know, so she did some research and just found that there's a, there was a subculture of gay men that were into S&M and bondage and mm -hmm. a big part of that play was nipple torture. And they had, they would be putting like, clamps and accoutrements and like clothespins on each other's nipples and pulling on them and torturing their nipples but all the stuff that they were using was kind of schlocky and cheap and they my my mother wanted to make the best product c to compete with all of that mm -hmm. and my father she wasn't into this stuff per se like she mm -hmm. didn't wasn't into S&M herself she just saw the opportunity and my father was an engineer so he was able to help her figure out so what the innovation was is they you know, an alligator clamp is like a little yeah. clamp that has the jagged teeth. You can just put, and it's tight, you know, just put that on your nipples, especially if you've never done it before. So what they did is they put these little rubber tips on them and then a set screw in it so you can adjust the tension so mm -hmm. you can make them tighter or looser. And that, that was the innovation, you know, and that was that. And you'll see that on any nipple clamp you buy today. It has the adjustable screw. My, f my, my parents invented that and they made a business out of this and it was just instructive for me to A, because I was surrounded by sexual deviancy, she had all these gay, really, really intense gay S&M magazines, like this magazine called Drummer Magazine, just had, I would read all the stories about, <laughs> and like it was and how old were you when you were 12, really? 11, 12, and you're like, I'm not gay, but I definitely f was Im I impressed upon by this sort of just this intensity this stuff in the mindset and the sort of the fantasy that goes around all of this stuff. Like my, my mother's friend was the one that would actually do more of the manual work, putting these things together. And my mom's job, my mom's part of the business was sort of coming up with the stories. Cause like how many times can you sell a pair of nipple clamps without making them distinct in some way? Mm -hmm. So she would have to come up with the names and the uses of them. And this good example of how brilliant she was with this was like, um, they had like the standard one, just a couple of nipple clamps, you just clamp them on. And then there was a smaller one that you could wear under your shirt. And she called that um, the executive. And the, the sort of play pattern with that was, is like a lot of gay men at the time, you know, had when they lived, worked in the corporate world and they had to, live in the closet they had to go mm -hmm. to their they had to closet themselves to go to their straight jobs and they you know and the idea of the executive nipple clamp is like you you could wear it under your dress shirt so you would be going working your job at wall street or in some advertising agency acting like a normal straight person but all the time known only to you you're wearing a little pair of nipple clamps underneath your shirt just to remind <laughs> yourself and to just live your your truth even though it's it's concealed and you know that was a su that was a successful endeavor, you know. And your mom's a genius. <laughs> yeah, but it was also it was like this was all happening in somebody's apartment, you know. Like there was a little area set aside where they had chain cutters and you know little clamps and just shit to put all this stuff together. So I'm just you know this funded all my Star Wars toys. So we'd be playing with my Millennium Falcons and Cantina f toys. And there's like a little small little factory right there. And that was sort of applicable to my own work. You know, it was just like, if you want to make something, make it in your house, you know, mm -hmm. just get the shit and make it in your house. And <clears throat> that's, that was my approach. And it just all sort of came together in whatever the hell this thing is. So, um, yeah. And now I'm just going to keep going with it. <laughs> I love that, dude. The super suck mom. 
I, I love her, by the way. I, I love your mom. I hope she's doing well. Yeah, she's fine. You can see some interviews with my mother on my podcast on YouTube called The Suck Hour. <laughs> she's on episode one, and then I think there's, she's, one, she's on one episode with my father where I ask them intimate details about all kinds of things. I don't think you've ever, I've ever mentioned your father in the 20 years, 15 years that I've known you. He's, he exists. Oh, well, I assume so. It does I mean, take two. I mean, he's, a, he's not quite as f showy and flamboyant and, you know, as my, as my mom. He's a little bit, he's British. He's from London. Mm -hmm. And he's a little, you know, he's a salt of the earth type guy. You know, he works with his hands. He was an engineer. You know, when he was a kid, he was working in tool and die shops. And, like, all my sort of manualist skills and all my, you know, sort of comfortableness with tools and building comes from him like my mom's a genius as far as coming up with concepts and ideas and thinking in the fourth dimension but she can barely figure out how to turn on the tv mm -hmm. you know whereas my father could take the tv apart mm -hmm. and put it back together so i got a, like a little bit of both you know like i have a good imagination but i also have the the discipline and the skills to to execute and 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 you know to the ideas, mm -hmm. you know, like he just, he has just really strong work ethic. I used to work, he used to be a building contractor and I used to go and help him and I hated every fucking minute <laughs> of it, putting up drywall and screwing and doing electrical work and cutting wood and all that stuff. But in, in retrospect, all that was very useful because it's like, if I see something that needs to be built or fixed, I have just complete confidence that I can do it or figure out how to do it. And not everybody has that, and I feel bad for them. But those are the things my f I got from my father. Yeah, all the things that I hated growing up, I'm really appreciative of now, too. So mm. it's a good thing, because you've become your own man, essentially, you know, which is great. Is it? Yes, it is. <laughs> well, you must have saw something there. You know, I've known you for 15 years. 2004. Five? 2005 at Comic-Con, you just walked up to me and it was like <laughs> I was in my Suck Lord gear at the time. First year I ever <laughs> wore the full silver costume to really? Comic-Con. Yeah. And, you know, I was still, you know, I was still unsure about all of it. And then, you know, I had the radio and then you just came over and you're like, hey, can you play anything, anything off of that? And I was oh like, God. I was like, oh, what do you want to hear? What do you want to hear? Oh, my God, who's <laughs> this hot, weird girl with two different color hot, eyes? Hot, weird girl. Yeah, you were like, had like blonde and black hair you had like the yellow eye and the red eye and you were wearing just like you know this red sort of tight red and black suit you know that was which is the suit that we based one of your earlier characters on and I was like who the fuck is this this is like my dream woman and she's asking me shit so whatever she wants I'm gonna accommodate <laughs> it so you come over with this disc I still man. have that effect on men <laughs> yeah I know, I know I know and good for you I mean I, I, I your superpowers have been an influence in me and as, in, as far as like creating you know larger than life characters your succubus styles you know definitely <laughs> have been an influence so you give me this fucking disc man and it's just got this awful techno music on it <laughs> and i'm just like this is off brand for me but i don't give a shit because she's hot she's dancing well, to well it. we Let's wound go. up we wound up we wound up becoming friends yeah we became really good friends and, and then i'm, I'm and really then glad I, you're and still they added, part of my life added, yeah i know and then you know added you to the collection to the menagerie you know because it's like i don't just make friends with people i collect them you know, and put them in, you know, like everybody that I become friends with gets a mask and becomes a supervillain, you know, and... What's going on with that anyway? Is it, is it like a frozen project? No, or? I work on it all the time. I mean, the supervillain project was a video thing where I wanted to, like, when YouTube first came out, I was like, I want to be able to sell my toys, and I figured, like, now you can put videos online easily you couldn't used to not be able to do that I was in a Lord of the Rings rap group like in 2003 mm -hmm. and we made some really cool videos but it's like in order to watch it you'd have to sit there with your fucking dial up <laughs> and download like a like a, a Windows a, 95 yeah download like a QuickTime <laughs> file it would take forever it just didn't get the exposure it didn't seem like a worthwhile endeavor where is that footage can we find that anywhere what now footage? the Lord of the Rings oh it's up there now now oh, it's up it? there yeah but at the time when we were doing how do I find that do it's I called Lords of the Rhymes Lords of the Rhymes. Yeah, and it was okay. two guys, two, it was Hobbit Hop. Hobbit Hobbit, Hop. Hobbit Rap. Hobbit. And it was like two guys that dressed like hobbits and would do like a sort of Beastie Boys style routine, but they mm -hmm. were very, very immersed in the lore of Tolkien. So, you know, they would rap in Entish were and Elvish. You? 
I was I played all the villains in that. Okay, you, I was, you weren't a Hobbit. No, I was part <laughs> of the stage show, and I would come out at the beginning. I had and, and I, would, I would had this big Sauron costume where we. I, I I was the guy like I had the smoke machine, and I had the hood with the beady eyes for the Black Riders, and I came out and beatboxed in the Gollum as Gollum. So I was like sort of more the support player mm -hmm. in the stage show, and I was all the villains, and. That the, the 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 Sauron became the necromancer in the in the villain show because what happened was when two, late two thousand five early two thousand six I was like wow I can just make movies and put them online yeah great let me sort of fill out my toy world with stories and characters and so I started making these shitty videos and made this thing called Original Villain Network which was supposed I to be that. the the stories and it was it turned out to be a little more difficult than I thought it was just like put the mask on turn on the camera go. And I thought we were going to come up with gold, and we didn't. But then as it, as it evolved, I started writing more, and I turned it into Toy Lords of Chinatown, which is the sort of like quasi-fictional interpretation of what I do in real life, where it's just all these supervillains, you know, these sort of like crime syndicates of supervillains, but instead of like selling drugs, the contraband is bootleg toys, and they're all just vying for supremacy in this sort of bootleg mm -hmm. toy world. And I created another character called Vectar, the intolerable, which was sort of like the foil to the suck lord. Like when I realized, like, okay, I can't have this guy be the star. I mean, the Mandalorian has sort of disproven my theory. I was like, I can't have the the main character as a ripped off Star Wars thing. For one, I was worried about getting sued, and also like he has no face, he has no means of expression, I, and and his voice is like modulated. It's like. I want to make an, a character that's not a Star Wars character and that you can actually see parts of his face. So I created this sort of cockroach man <laughs> with, where you can see the eyes and the mask. And I was like, he was going to be the, the protagonist of this story. And he was sort of the opposite of the Suck Lord, where the Suck Lord, it, I mean, it's me versus me in this, but it was like the Suck Lord was the megalomaniac and the, the you know the pimping spaceman and the vector was the small jealous one so it's like you know it's a, it's a it's a trope and a bit of a cliche to make a film where it's like a man at war with himself but usually it's his noble side versus ignoble side and in this case it was just two different aspects of my bad self you know <laughs> like it was just two bad guys fighting each other neither of them had any real redeeming value and i was just making stories around that and then i cast all my friends as you know supporting characters you know, and you were in that, and we're still working on it. I mean, it's, I have to, it's, it's a lot of work to make an independent movie with no money, especially mm -hmm. when you're trying to run a business. So I film it as I, as I can. And the fifth episode will be coming out this year. And what are you doing with all the old footage that you... It's, it's, some of it's online. Yeah? It's not great, but it's like, it shows the progression. What is your YouTube handle? It's just handle? Suck Hour Suckadelic. Suckadelic. I have a separate YouTube channel for the podcast called The Suck Hour. You're on that. Yes. I interview you. <laughs> and we tell a lot of the same stories. But it's like if you want to know your story, <laughs> My side of the you story. can watch that. What it's episode was that? Like 15 or something? I don't 15, know. I don't remember. It's, it's up there. 11. <laughs> and then the other channel is this, I think it's just Suck Lord on YouTube. It's either Suck Lord or Suckadelic. And it has that. And then there's like a bunch of toy, fake toy commercials. Like mm -hmm. we did a lot of spoofed, Star Wars spoofed Star Wars commercials where we just sort of play with the toys. It's like grown-ass people acting like kids, <laughs> playing with toys. And I spoof a lot of Japanese toy commercials, and there's a few other things up there. And the, and toy, the first four episodes of Toy Lords of Chinatown is up there. That's awesome. It is. <laughs> if you say so. Sorry, I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to pump myself it. up too hard. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy sex life. To is come. this over now? <laughs> Do you want to keep going? We can. <laughs> no, I mean, we can. It's up to you. I think that covers everything for the most part. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or say to your loyal fans and all the women who I don't are know touching who, themselves I don't right know now who, watching you? I don't know who's watching this. I'm pretty, I don't know if any of my loyal fans are watching this because they've heard all these stories a million times. But if there's any new people watching this, um, you know, I, I highly suggest you just invest in this. And yeah, my Instagram is sucklord. My Twitter is Sucklord. My website is Suckadelic.com. And you could just Google all that shit. I give great Google. And there's plenty of stuff there. And my website has all the TV shows and all the, all the things you could ever possibly want to consume. And I'm most, in, I'm my most active on Instagram. Like, okay. I've been doing the stories a lot and getting a lot of return on that. 
Like I, inst I, I did Instagram stories for the whole AVN catastrophe, and that was great. Nice. It's a little. There's. It's like a little bit. A little. Some ass and some toys and <laughs> metaphysical commentary from myself. You know about making sense of all of it. And oh. every once in a while, there's a tutorial. Can we get you to put on the sock? It's helmet? not gonna fit. But sure. <laughs> no. This is for your child. Well, it's an adult size one. <laughs> I made that helmet for my son, and I, I made a little mini suck lord to go surprise him <laughs> at Designer Con. You look great. Thank you so He's much no for coming. He's no good to me, Dad. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, The Mandalorian proved me right in a lot of ways, but we'll talk about that another time. Thanks for coming. Thank I you. I love you. Do you, though? I do. I'll always love you. <laughs> Bye.